Thanks for plugging in. Today, we're talking excellence with TE Connectivity and the Interconnect Specialists from TTI ip e It's the news, information, and detail you need to know to stay informed about the latest innovations in all types of electronics connectivity. And now, here's your host, TTI's Scott Stimley. Thanks, Jim, and hello, everybody. Great to have you tuning in to our latest series of Talking Excellence with TE and TTI. I'm your host, Scott Stemley, Director of Supplier Marketing for TTI Incorporated. My career in the electronics distribution spans 38 years in a variety of roles, including sales leadership, asset management, business development, supplier marketing, and with the last 32 of those years here at TTI. I'm fortunate to have John Holder with me for this episode. John is the TTI Technical Supplier Marketing Manager for our Electromechanical Product Offering. John? Why don't you give us an overview of your career? Yes, I've been in the uh, electronics industry for about 40 years with primary focus in the relay switch and sensor market, held various roles in sales, product marketing, uh, product management, with main focus mainly in relays and switches. I've been at TTI for about 12 years. Great. Thank you, John. Uh, Also joining us for this episode is TE Connectivity Staff Field Application Engineer, Brian Limeberry. Brian, happy to have you with us here today. Uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and your career at TE? Yeah, thanks. I am uh, I'm an FAE, um, specifically uh, d- dedicated to relays, uh, DC contactors, and a few other products here at TE. I've been with the company for 38 years, I'm based in North Carolina. Um, worked with uh, relays for uh, about 18 years. So, yeah, looking forward to a conversation today, see what we can learn about relays. Very good. Thank you, Brian. So, first question I have for you. The first relay was invented almost 200 years ago in 1835 by Joseph Henry for a telegraph system. While the basic concept is still in use today, the size and capabilities have greatly improved. But electromechanical relays have not been totally replaced by solid-state relays. Brian, why is that? Mm. Yeah, that's a question that we get sometimes. Yeah, by now everything was supposed to be solid state. Why are we still using this this old uh, technology? Electromechanical relays are not going away anytime soon. And um, a couple of the reasons that keep coming to the top, you know, why a solid state relay wouldn't work. First of all, just the application of it, the installation of it. Typically, uh, external heat sink is required. Solid state relays typically create a lot of uh, a lot of heat. Now we're ta- not talking about FET level solid state switching, but power switching. So external heat sinks are expensive. They're large. Sometimes it's perfect, uh, but usually that's that's a challenge. Another thing is with solid state relays. It's hard to find any um, multiple configurations like uh, normally open, normally closed in one relay or uh, two normally open, two normally closed, for example. Those kind of configurations, it would really increase the size of the solid state relay due to the extra circuitry required. So kind of limited on a, it's like an on-off switch for the most part. Uh, the larger volumes are, are very simple like that way. Another thing about solid state relays is there's almost always a leakage current. Some applications, that's fine, but in some applications, it's just not acceptable. Regulation standards um, don't allow any leakage current. Uh, An air gap is still required. And that's where electromechanical relays uh, are still winning the day. So yeah, solid state relays are fantastic in very specific conditions but um, not replacing electromechanical relays anytime soon. Since relays are basically two separate circuits consisting of a coil and contacts, what improvements have been made in each? Yeah, relays are two circuits. That's where two circuits come together. On the coil side, improvements, you know, during my day, the coil winding technology, the technology that used to wind the coil, it's just incredible to see it in person. The speed, the precision, every relay has to be wound perfectly with precision number of turns. Um, the quality of the uh, of the magnet wire, you can't allow any, there's no room for any, um, you know, failures of insulation. So just the manufacturing of the coil side. On the contact circuit that you mentioned, one thing that I've witnessed uh, during my, my days with relays is migration away from mechanical riveting of the contact 
to the spring or to the carrier. I'm like a rivet used, used to, that would be the common way to attach the contact to the spring. But at my company and, and probably in others as well, there's been a migration over the recent years to electrical welding. So no more mechanical riveting uh, and the problems that it can cause, uh, the extra material that's required with rivets, but just a small wafer of a contact can be welded uh, to the carrier. So that eliminates a lot of problems. Also, contact on the contact circuit, uh, hazardous substances. That used to be really common in, in relay contacts, uh, any, any electrical contacts for switching. Those have really been squeezed out by regulations over the years, and now well, even cadmium. From what we're hearing, uh, the the European exemption for cadmium is is going away. So, for markets outside the U.S., you know that's something that hopefully relay manufacturers have prepared for. I know we we have at TE. So, that's a couple things, uh, some some changes that I've seen in those two circuits. I often see circuit designs with uh, with diodes in parallel with the coil. What is the purpose? And Brian, can you tell us what the, the good and bad aspects or the positive and ne negative aspects of that is? The, the relay coil is a coil. It's an inductor. And uh, when it's charged with, uh, say, 24 volts DC, the current running through that coil will charge up an electromagnetic field. When you remove that, when you deactivate or de-energize the relay, take that voltage away, that uh, the electromagnetic field collapses on that coil and you get a voltage spike. So current flows again uh, in the reverse direction and wouldn't normally hurt anything except uh, it seems like oftentimes there's some kind of a, a, a digital solid state uh, device upstream from the relay coil and a voltage spike that this flyback voltage um, could damage that. So a lot of times designers will uh, put a diode in parallel to the relay coil. And what happens is when the voltage is removed, it gives a path for this current to, to dissipate and it kind of cycles there near the, the coil and, and it reduces the voltage, the flyback voltage spike. So that's the reason that you would see a diode typically across a coil. It, it, it minimizes, mitigates that flyback voltage spike and protects the circuitry upstream. But you ask about the, the good and bad aspects of them. You solve one problem, you might create another. And whenever you have this uh, flyback diode in parallel with the coil, it will affect the operation of the relay. That voltage spike that you're trying to get rid of, that was like an instantaneous release of energy, which means that the, um, the contact side of the relay can close quickly. Now, if you're going to take away that voltage spike and you're going to dampen or, buy, or, or kind of muffle that EMF, uh, you're going to slow down the opening of the relay contacts. So the release time of the relay increases or, or the contacts move slower from closed to open when you de-energize de the relay. It's because of that coil. We recommend that the customer watch out for this. It can be a problem with um, with some loads in some environments. And the best workaround and what we recommend is don't just use a single flyback diode, but put a Zener diode in series with it. The Zener diode in series with the flyback diode it clips the voltage and you kind of get a compromise. The contacts will not open as slowly, which is, uh, which is good. What's the benefit of a quickly opening contact? Less arcing. Relay arcing, especially on brake, certain loads like inductive loads, that really kills the relay contact and the relay life can be heavily reduced. The Zener diode is a compromise. So that's a little bit of the history or the, uh, the purpose of the diode across the coil. So, Brian, are there specific scenarios where this becomes especially critical? Well, if you have a scenario where you're not getting the life you expect out of the relay, and if you've eliminated all the conditions of the contact circuit, you know, make sure everything's within spec, and you can't figure out why your relay is, is dying so quickly, I would recommend take a look at this because in some scenarios where you've got maybe like a the worst case load might be a highly inductive load because of the this, this small power factor, you're gonna get a lot of arcing. Now you're gonna open it more slowly, you're gonna have even more arcing. Sometimes the temperature, the, the current, the voltage, uh, you're maybe you're on the upper end of the relay rating, you know, kind of pushing the limit, the upper limit of the relay anyway. You know, so in a lot of conditions, having a slow release time 
or I should say a long release time, a slow release, might not be a problem. But it can be if you're kind of pushing the limits. So, uh, for example, we've seen some, we've taken some measurements where when you, uh, if you just add the flyback diode with no additional Zener diode, uh, it can slow down the contact opening like by five times. The Zener, put the Zener diode and you get somewhere between, you know, somewhere in the middle of compromise. So yeah, under some some conditions, something seemingly insignificant like this can, can help. Great, thank you. Brian, TE manufactures and sells many different types of power uh, PCB relays for the industrial market from three to 30 amps. Why are there so many different varieties? You mentioned three to 30. Yeah, I guess below three, we've got a signal portfolio, but that would not be power. You said power. So yeah, there's there's different types, different sizes because of just the different needs. It just seems like a infinite number of combinations of needs and that customers have, just a very high number of situations. How long, like the relay life, some factors that the d- designer, you know, has to take into account the, the relay life that you intend for it to have, the the load parameters I, re- I kind of referenced before, earlier, such as the voltage, the current, uh, the ambient temperature of the relay is critical. Power factor is important. How much isolation do you need? All of those go into affecting the materials you choose, the size you choose, the geometry of and of all the different components within the relay, which affects the physical size. And then finally, there's the price. It would be great if, if, if any application below 30 amps, you know, you just get a 30 amp relay, but it wouldn't be practical when you think of the price it would cost, the board space and so forth. So that's why there's, um, there's like a, a graduated uh, spectrum of relays across this, this current spectrum that you've mentioned to kind of handle those more precisely to, from optimum economy as well as performance. So, um, you know, just looking at the TE portfolio, Brian, um, you know, it, it seems like the uh, RTRZ um, series has become the preferred relay for many different markets, a very, very broad uh, range of in applications. What type of markets prefer these relays and what do they control in those applications? Yeah, um, some of the listeners might be familiar with the phrase general purpose relays. And there's no relay that illustrates that phrase better than this RTRZ family that we have. It's a 16 amp class relay, first uh, designed and, and released by the Shrack company, which is uh, a that's that's us now, 30 some years ago, and it's used everywhere. General purpose, it really is truly used in almost uh, any market you could you could imagine: residential and commercial, uh, industrial, building automation, uh, smart homes, uh, lighting lighting controls, uh, HVAC applications, building management systems, industrial automation from the panel to the IO in some cases uh, out to the even to the motor drives. We, we see it uh, a lot of different markets. It's widely used. Ron, I see that TE has several different data sheets to cover just the RTRZ series. Why are so many data sheets needed? Yeah, that's a good point. Um, I think there's 18 to 20 different data sheets required for RZ and RT altogether. And that just speaks to the wide number of variants that there are within the family. This design has been copied by all of our competitors. It's a very common, very common general purpose footprint. Demand is growing as we see. You know, this 30-year-old relay, it just demand keeps going up. But the variations over the years to meet all these different needs designers have faced they lead to new designs and new iterations new versions new generations and and that translates into into a lot of data sheets um hazardous location for example two pole version bifurcated contacts for very low level switching uh, several different versions handling inrush current uh, whether it's capacitive or inductive even um, latching versions all, all kinds of different and it just it's just a highly evolved family over all these years, and it demonstrates just the genius of the design and and how adaptable this platform is. Brian, if we're just to you know take a step back and and think about you know three main applications for the RTRZ series, I think I've heard you know we we've talked in the past about you know if you've got a motor in your application, if there's any motion whatsoever in your application, or if you're dealing with heat in any application. Are, are those kind of the three high level, if you're 
application does any of those, the RTRZ series would be a great solution. Yeah, no doubt. And and those those um, high level categories that you mentioned, you know, you could you could say the same thing about other relays. Um, uh, RT and RZ are not the only, uh, you know, not the only relays for motion. For example, it depends on the level of current and and some other factors as well. But but that's a, that's a great way to put it. Heat and motion and uh, uh, so yeah, that those kinds of things. Uh, that's a great way to to describe when a relay is appropriate. That's correct. And RT and RZ would be right in the middle of that. Yes. All right. Perfect. Perfect. Well, Brian, you know, thank you for sharing your insights and time with us today. Um, it's been very informative. Thanks for the time. Thanks for the audience. Uh, appreciate your time listening. Let us know if there's some way that we can help. We'll do our best. Thanks, Brian. And thank you to our listeners for plugging in. If you learned something today, you'll want to play the next episode of Talking Excellence with TE and TTI, where we'll hear from Emmanuel Angelis. TE Industry Sales Manager as he explores charging solutions for autonomous mobile robots on the factory floor. That's it for this episode of Talking Excellence. Join us next time for the podcast that brings together the specialists of TTI with the connectivity experts from TE and insightful conversation about getting connected.